holding on to the to the commitment that they made when we took them to court and won a victory as equal education. So by not resuming the NSNP, um, the DBE is promoting hunger and malnutrition within our lives. And this is really sad for me as a high school going learner at Oakland High School. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Liama, we all heard you. Uh, your powerful words uh, on behalf of young people. Uh, I failed to mention that you're a grade 11 student at Oakland's uh, school when I introduced you uh, and clearly a very committed student as I can see from your tie with your drama club and lab assistant and a proud young uh, activist who takes the constitution and rights and ideas of solidarity and sympathy and empathy very seriously. Thank you, all power to you and your- Thank you so much for having me. It is such an honor to be part of this meeting. Thank you and, and, and good luck. And we hope that you'll continue and that you'll take uh, the, today's discussions into equal education and uh, to your fellow uh, students. We're going to I move on now. Thank you, thank you. We're going to move on now, still on the theme of voices from the front line. Uh, we now have a speaker who's going to focus on the question of mothers struggling to make ends meet during the lockdown. Uh, that speaker is Dr. Wanga Zembe, who is a senior scientist at the South African Medical uh, Research Council um, and whose research has focused on poverty and child health and whose main interests are in these issues of social policy as it, as, as it relates to poverty, inequality, health and well-being. So, uh, Dr. Zembe, thank you too for joining us today and bringing your perspective to this launch. I uh, now hand over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to make a, a, a short um, presentation um, of findings uh, from a study that we conducted last year during the lockdown to understand how primary caregivers of children receiving child support grant were coping. Um, and just a, a quick disclaimer before I start, this is unpublished work which must be published, so please do not quote it. Um, thank you. So as I said, um, we're presenting, I'm presenting data that we collected last year um, from a study that we conducted here in Cape Town um, with primary caregivers of children receiving the child support grant to get a sense of how they were coping um, with the lockdown and the, and the pandemic. We conducted the study in Langa um, with 20 primary caregivers who participated in another longitudinal birth court study that we were um, running at the time. Um, and so I'm now going to, what I really want to do with this presentation is to give us um, what the mother said in their own words, share what they said in their own words as much as possible. And so one of the key themes that have been coming through um, the data is that in, when mothers contrast the period before the lockdown and the lockdown, um, they were saying that things were already very bad before the lockdown. They were already living very precariously. Um, but with the lockdown, everything became much worse because they were not able to engage in the usual activities they, that they would engage in to bring in extra money. So there was um, experiencing far more frequent um, food shortages as a result. As one mother um, told us, food is finished. For instance, I did not go out to work this month, so food has run out. The groceries gradu gradually run out until there is nothing. And they were saying that what was making things worse was that the lockdown forced them to keep children at home. And so the children were wanting to eat all the, all of, you know, all the time as a result. And so food was running up much faster. Um, as this other mother also put it, since they are home the whole time, they want food constantly. So it's not easy being on lockdown. Um, and this was exacerbated by the suspension of the school feeding program that the previous learner just told us about, um, which meant that children are now at home requiring all meals um, in, you know, for, for the day instead of requiring only a few meals. 
As one mother put it, it was difficult because of the children, especially because they have to constantly eat. The older one, when she was at school, it was much better. Now that she's home, I have to buy cereal for both of them. She used to get her daily meals from school. All I needed to do was cereal in the morning and send her to school. Now they are both home. I have to give all those meals. I have to buy more for them. It makes life difficult when people are at home and they are all struggling and are always at home. It creates tension and conflict. And in talking about how they were then coping with this um, much more severe lack um, of food, um, the mothers were telling us that they were having to regularly skip meals and ration their own meals and um, sacrifice other essential needs to make sure that their children had food. As this mother um, shared with us, when we cook in this house, my husband and I have to make sure that we only eat once a day so that the children can continue eating during the day and have more meals out of that pot. Um, what's also come through very powerfully through um, the interviews is that women are the ones who've been bearing the brunt of the pandemic. Um, they're the ones who have to hustle and figure out what has to be eaten. Um, as this mother told us, yes, it is stressful. I'm the only one who must make sure everyone is fed. Um, but in addition to having to hustle for food and make sure everyone is fed, they were also having to keep their male partner's spirits up, cheer everyone up, make sure everyone is happy because they were saying their male partners were being depressed feeling depressed by the lockdown and, and by the fact that they couldn't look for jobs or, or, or jobs were scarce. And so she said, you know men, they can't cope with feeling useless. This introduced tension in some relationships and one caregiver told us that yes, there is tension and conflict because we only have the one child support grant to live on and men cannot handle having to rely on someone or something that is not his and that he did not work for himself. He prefers to work for his living. And what also further worsened um, the situation for mothers was that the lockdown meant that they could no longer rely on the usual forms of help and support that they would tend to before the um, pandemic. As one ma mother um, explained, who would loan you money at a time like this? No one has money to spend, no one has food. And so mothers were very grateful for the increase um, in social grants, um, particularly for the caregiver's grant increase, which they though recognized as, as being a child um, support grant top up, not, a, not an increase for themselves and felt um, that it was unfair that they couldn't apply for the COVID-19 grant. So they, they repeatedly told us that they needed further support, especially because of the sharp increase in food prices since the lockdown. As one mother explained, the increase did not really make much difference because at the time, at the same time, grocery prices increased at the stores we buy from. And the increase really made then made no difference for us. We afford the same as we did when we had 400. I realized that I couldn't even afford Vaseline for the kids because every time, every item has gone up, Millie meal has gone up and all the staples. And finally, um, what's come through powerfully is that um, these mothers, um, the primary caregivers, feel that their situation of poverty um, makes them, exposes them unfairly to um, risks that they, that other people are not taking, having to return to work or seek work when they felt that it was still un unsafe to do so. Um, this is as we were, the, the levels of the lockdown were, were um, changing and decreasing. One mother told us, that this was forcing them to choose between hunger and death, saying we should not have to choose between hunger and death just because we are poor. Other people are not having to make that choice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zembe. Uh, I think you've just, in a sense, described the title of today's uh, uh, webinar, the slow vi you've shown us the meaning of the slow violence of hunger. And I must say that I've often wondered as somebody who's a journalist and a writer, how to describe the pain that people are going through. Millions of people who aren't able to feed themselves or to feed their children and to wonder what it means, how much actually you can buy with 365 rand a month in terms of meeting the actual needs of children and of, uh, of growing children. And what is meant by something that we heard about in one of the st studies called shielding children, parents who shield children by eating less themselves in order to make sure that there is still food on the table for the children. And your very important research, I think, uh, answers some of those questions. So thank you for doing the research 
and being available today and uh, putting this, 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 this in front of uh, all of us. None of us can say we do not know and that we have not heard uh, those voices. So doc, Dr. Zembe, thank you very much and good luck with bringing this to publication. Um, I'm moving on now to Dr. Mafiko, uh, who's the deputy representative of UNICEF uh, in South Africa, uh, the South Africa country office. And again, is somebody who has spent a long time uh, working in the field of health, children's health, working in countries such as Zimbabwe uh, and South Africa, and who therefore brings uh, an important uh, additional international perspective uh, to today's uh, discussion. So Dr. Mur uh, Muriel Mafiko, the Deputy Representative of UNICEF in South Africa, uh, over to you. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mafiko. Uh, everybody, just a moment while I try to establish the whereabouts of our uh, speaker. Um, okay, if uh, um, Uriel Mafiko is not available at the moment. Uh, I'm going to move on to our next speaker, but before I introduce uh, Saliso Tipaniani, uh, I would just like to say to uh, all of you who are with us today that uh, we're now talking about a human rights perspective on food and nutrition uh, security, and that is the subject that our three speakers are going to address. Um, after the next three speakers, we're going to take a few minutes for any comments and questions from the floor. So if you have any comments or questions, please put them in the chat, indicate who those questions are going to be to directed at, and we will have a few minutes because we're keeping very good time up to now. Uh, but I'm now going to turn over to uh, uh, Celiso Tipaniani, advocate this time instead of a doctor, uh, a lawyer, uh, somebody who is the chief executive officer of the South African Human Rights Commission uh, and who has been an activist around the constitution and human rights for, for very many years. Uh, Celiso Tipaniani, if you are uh, with us, uh, I would invite you now to uh, speak for uh, five minutes on uh, children, nutrition, as a child rights imperative. Uh, Salisa Tipignani. Mark, you're mute. Uh, I was just saying, given that uh, we don't have Saliso Tipaniani yet, and uh, given that we, we don't seem to have Muriel Mafiko, my apologies to, to the audience. We just have a slight glitch. But I do see that we have Dr. Tracy Naledi, uh, who is the Deputy Dean of Health Services at the Faculty of Health Sciences, also at UCT. She's the chairperson of an organization called Tecano, uh, and she is able to speak to us on health equity and food injustice and food justice. Uh, Dr. Uh, Naledi is a public health physician, so again, she's another passionate advocate of these issues. Dr. Naledi, uh, over to you. Thank you very much for being with us uh, this morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark uh, Dumelang, 
Mulweni, Huemora, good morning, friends, colleagues, and fighters for health equity. Special greetings to METEPO and our VC and all protocol observed. We would like to stand in solidarity with the Child Institute, the Child Gage team, and all the partners and, and researchers responsible for delivering what promises to be yet another insightful gauge for 2021. With a very provocative but yet fitting title, The Slow Violence of Child Hunger. I come from the premise that health is fundamentally a social justice issue where equal economic, political and social rights and opportunities are essential for health. I will be highlighting a few key messages drawn from last year's chapter that was the parting gift of the late David Sanders, our colleague, teacher, mentor and friend to many of us from many walks of life and from many professions. David Saunders wrote about the triple burden of malnutrition in childhood in South Africa, highlighting undernutrition, overnutrition, and poor micro, uh, micronutrient status, for example, uh, vitamin A, zinc, and, and zinc deficiencies. I'm so pleased that this issue is a core priority for this gauge. Believe it or not, Undernutrition and stunting in particular has remained the same in South Africa over the last 20 years at a very high prevalence of 27%. Of, of 27 this was in 2016. This is hardly surprising since South Africa is the most unequal country in the world. The richest 1% of South Africans own two thirds of the country's wealth with the top 10% owning 93% and the remaining 90% owning a mere 7%. As Metsapo has highlighted, incomes have not grown with food prices, increases and more and more households are struggling to feed themselves. Furthermore, opportunities to escape from poverty are still racially and disproportionately distributed 25 years after our democracy. Less than one in two black kids finish high school in South Africa. Women and black women in particular are the face of poverty. Male-headed households in South Africa have an annual income that is two thirds more than of female-headed households. Much of women's work is unpaid, further entrenching poverty, poor nutrition in women, mothers that impact child nutrition and health. This was all before COVID-19. And as we've heard from Dr. Zembe, the situation is even worse, trapping even more women and children in poverty and hunger. Friends and colleagues, this is violence. The obesity and this persistent stunting is influenced by the global and the local increase in the consumption of ultra processed foods that are highly refined, high in sugar, unhealthy fats and salt, low in fiber and micronutrients. And they contain additives to extend their shelf life and to modify their color, flavor and texture and are specifically formulated to, to taste overly lovely and be habit forming, forming, leading to excessive consumption and rapid weight gain. I'm talking about breakfast cereals, biscuits, sugar sweetened beverages, sweets, snack bars, cheese, bread, processed meats like bologna. What is even more distressing is that in about one in four children under two years old, they already consume these unhealthy sugary foods. And these foods are marketed to children who have limited knowledge to make better choices. And they set dietary habits and preferences which are incredibly difficult to change at a later age, further entrenching obesity in adolescence and adulthood. Although many of the leading brands have committed not to market unhealthy products to children under 12, research that has been done by our colleagues at Vets at Priceless shows that the, there are billboards that are actually sitting very close to schools and, and with nearby vendors who are conveniently placed to then fulfill that need of, of those unhealthy foods. Agricultural and food 
corporations have been enabled to accumulate super profits by global trade agreements and the consolidation and automation of all levels of or, or within the food system from production, storage, all the way to marketing and retail. Not only have these mega food production systems brought in much more unhealthy foods, but they've also resulted in loss of job opportunities in the food sector, increased urbanization, and have destroyed some of the more local vibrant markets. This exploitation for profit is violence. The level of interpersonal violence in poor urban communities in particular also prevents young people from freely engaging in outside physical activity, further entrenching and increasing obesity rates. Ultimately, for us to attain food justice and to break the slow violence of malnutrition and child hunger, we must understand that we need to transform food production systems, deal with the social and structural inequalities and the institutional power and policy framework that influence our environment, our living conditions, our behavior, and how we function as a society. I lend my voice to congratulate the team for getting the gauge up, even under very challenging and complex um, context of the COVID-19 pandemic. I look forward to reading it and hearing more about the highlights today. Long live the spirit of David Sanders, long live. Gamagu, I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Naledi. Thank you for reminding us in your presentation that the issue of food and nutrition security is an inequality issue. Thank you also for reminding us that it's a political issue and that malnutrition and obesity is often a consequence of market failure.